Hey friends, I'm Otis Gibbs, and this is my buddy Kenny Vaughn. He's going to share some great stories about Buck Owens. Here's one Buck Owens story that's really good. Uh, you know, there, there's a songwriter here in town named Danny Flowers, and he wrote a song called Tulsa Time. So he, he said, uh, yeah, man, I was, I was out in L.A., and I was introduced to Buck Owens, and he shook my hand and said, have you ever met me before? <laughs> and it seems like I had one. Other. Oh, yeah. The other one is uh, Buck Owens presented. Buck Owens had this big ceremony at the Crystal Palace where there's a statue and all this stuff. You know, I don't know if you've ever been to the place, but it's 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 like kind of like a cross between Cracker Barrel and, and Disney World, only cheap. But um, he had this big ceremony there when he was opening up and he wanted Marty to come out and he. He said, I want to give you Don Rich's Silver Sparkle Telecaster. And Marty said, all right, Buck, you know, they knew each other. And Marty flies out there. They have this, you know, reporters and, you know, all the stuff, news, cameras, and big ceremony with, with what, what it was, you know, and he presents Marty with a guitar and you know, takes pictures, you know. And Marty goes back to Nashville with a guitar, you know. And so about two weeks went by and Buck calls and says, I'm going to need that guitar back. <laughs> Buck just a, Owens. Just a publicity stunt? Yeah. <laughs> I was playing with the Sweethearts of the Rodeo, and we were playing at his club before he built that place that he, that he built later, the Crystal Palace, which is kind of like a Cracker Barrel. There's no backstage, no load-in. It's like a Cracker Barrel with a, with a stage and a bar. If you can imagine that. That's what the Crystal Palace is. It's like, a musician built this place? What? You know, there's a Cadillac behind the bar on the wall, you know. There's all, yeah, I mean, but, you know, it's like the most ill-thought-out building ever for musicians. You know, like, you have to walk through the crowd to get to the stage. There's no place. They, they, at that time, the backstage was like in the... Um, where the beer cooler was and stuff, you know, but in the kitchen. That's, there was no backstage. That was it. The, the place we played at was the place he had before that, which was like a upstage about this high and folding chairs and a little service bar in the back, you know. And Buck sat right in the front row, you know. You know he obviously, he was... The girls that I worked for, the Sweethearts of the Rodeo, were sisters from L.A., and they were... Uh, rootsy country rockers, kind of rockabilly, kind of Amy Lou Harris, kind of, you know, Buddy Holly, kind of that, you know, that whole kind of thing, you know, rootsy and um, kind of country, but not too country because they were from L.A., you know, and they were really pretty and dressed really well. You know, they looked really good. And I think Buck was happy to have them in his club. And so I met him, but it was he didn't care about me. You know, he was. He was there to see the girls. Yeah. <laughs> when I first was playing guitar, I had an, uh, I got my hands on this little crummy little folk guitar, and um, it wasn't very good, but I was plunking around on it, you know, and across the street was um, the kid I went to school with, and his father was, a, he was a country music guy, and he had Buck Owens records, and Johnny Cash records, and Merle Haggard records. He was a, that were those were his guys, you know, and so I heard that stuff over there, and I was like, man, this 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 is cool music, man, you know, like that sounds like rock and roll, you know, buck at once, you know, tie by the tail. I mean, come on, man, that sounds just as groovy as anything by the Rolling Stones or the Beatles or whatever, you know. Well, that's what I was listening to, you know. And I'd go over there and I'd hear all that stuff. Like, yeah, man, that's cool. In '68, he came to Denver, and we went out to see him at the Four Seasons nightclub. So I got to see Buck Owens and the Buckaroos. So I would have been, uh, what, uh, 14 when I saw him? That's a pretty great era yeah, to but, see Buck Owens. Yeah, but, you know, I'd seen all these shows before that. You know, when I was 13 or 14, I saw loads of cool shows. You know, I saw Janis Joplin with Big Brother and the Holding Company and Country Joe and the Fish. Yeah, I mean, I saw all kinds of great people. Like Jimi Hendrix and... The Doors and Captain Beefheart and uh, 
the one show I'm really kicking myself. My parents, you know, I had to sneak out sometimes, you know, and I was going to go to see the Buffalo Springfield. But that night, it was like a school night. And then my mom was like, come on, you've been going out too much. You can't go to that. And I'm like, come on, man. It's a Buffalo Springfield. <laughs> so I didn't get to see that one. I don't know if this is true or not. I heard that Buck and, and Don Ritchie still like plug into the same amp. Yes, they always did. That's a true story. They Buck had a 59 basement that was spray painted black. I think, or it had been recovered in black, but it looks from the photographs like it had been spray painted black over the tweed, you know. And um, I, there's pictures of him using that at Capitol when he was doing sessions for other people because Ken Nelson was using him as a guitar player at Capitol, you know, when Jimmy Bryant was the main guy and then James Burton came to town when he was 19 and kind of, Ken had to kind of push Jimmy off to the side and put James in the lead guitar chair because James was doing what the kids wanted to hear, you know. You know, the first guy in L.A. that was playing really light strings and bending him, you know, with that sound, that steel guitar tone, you know. Nobody had done that until James came to town. So he went to the, you know, first chair. That's how he ended up on Haggard Records and all those other country records, you know. Do we know any particular songs that Buck played on as a guitar player? Uh, I know that he plays the opening um, figure, the first thing you hear on A Lot of Lovin' by Gene Vincent in the Blue Caps. That's him. It's Johnny Meeks on the lead guitar on that, on that cut, but that's Buck playing the rhythm guitar on his Telecaster. And uh, that's one I know for sure. Pretty good record. Really good record. Yeah, they played, Don and Buck were touring, Buck went up to Tacoma for some reason or other. He was, maybe a radio station or something was going on. They had a studio there. I think it's the same studio where Loretta Lynn made her first record, her first single. It's not Blue Kentucky Girl, it's some other record. But the, I think that's the flip side. I'm not sure. But that's the first record she ever made was in Tacoma before she came to Nashville and got a record deal. But... Buck was up there doing something, and he met Don, who was a fiddle player. And Don played a little bit of guitar, and so they would drive around and do these gigs as a duo. It was just the two of them, and they had Buck's basement, you know, and so they'd plug into that, you know, because there were two channels, and it was fine, you know, a pretty powerful amp, you know. And um, I'm sure it worked out fine for him. And uh, the night I saw him, there were... Three dual showmans on stage, one for the steel player, one for the bass player, and one for Buck and Don. No reverb on it on the stage, you know. Just, but it was a big cavernous place, so I didn't I didn't know that they didn't have reverb. I mean, it still sounded reverby to me. But that's how they traveled at the time with coil coil cords, you know. So you could clearly see Don's cord going into the same amp that Buck was into, you know. And both guitars sounded clear. Oh, yeah. Well, they were dual showmans. Yeah. Those things were loud, man. They probably only had them on two and a half, you know. But it was a big place, and it was the largest dance floor in the area, like west of the Mississippi till, till you got to California. I think it was the biggest dance floor. I ended up playing at that joint in the 80s. And when it would fill up, you couldn't hear anything over the dancers. It was like a cattle well, yeah, I mean, it's like you get like you know, a couple hundred people dancing. It's loud. I mean, it's like, whoa, you know. Fridays and Saturday nights, you had to turn up just to hear yourself, you know. But, um, but when they came out on stage, the ladies were screaming. And it was just like, it was like the Beatles came. It was, and it had that rock and roll edge to it, you know. They were really, you know, aggressive. And I don't know who the drummer was. It wasn't Willie Cantu. He was already gone. He was, you know, Willie, you know, is, you know, part of the Buck Owens sound, but he was only in the band for like two years, you know. He's like, you know, he says, you know, these people always credit me as being a Buck Ruo. And he said, they should credit the guys that were there for 10 years, not me. I was only there for almost two years, you know. I wanted to be a jazz drummer. I didn't want to play that stuff, you know. He said when he came back to Nashville, about, I guess he came back to town here about 20 years ago, 25 years ago. He said, I had to learn to play like I did when I was 21 years old. He said, I, ha I hadn't done it since, you know, and I was like, you know, people wanted me to do that. And I was like, 
I had to go back and relearn how to play like I did a long time ago when I was a kid. Oh, yeah, and the same mic. Yeah, they, they were on the same mic. You know, Don would just step up to Buck's mic and sing. And that place had a good sound system, you know, for that era. Yeah. You, know, the, you know, it was good enough to get the vocals up because, you know, it was fine. They had a proper stage and, and two speakers and some microphones, you know, so, yeah. you know, you could hear them. It seems like the two voices together oh. and that guitar is just so much excitement. Yeah. They were just so good and well rehearsed. It was a lot of comedy, bad comedy and just goofball, cutting up, corniness. But when they played and sang, it was like, yeah, man. And I don't think Tom Brumley was there. I'm not sure. I think he was gone by then, too. 68, I'm not sure. Because I didn't know who those people were at the time. I didn't even know Don Rich's name until maybe that night or a little bit after that. You know, I just knew he was that guy that played the cool guitar that, looked, that smiled all the time and sang the harmony, you know. Yeah. You know, but I didn't know that much about him. It wasn't until soon after that I kind of dug down deep and really paid more attention to him after watching him live. So I can't tell you who, I think Doyle Holly was playing bass. Because he was whoever it was, seemed like Doyle Holly, and I I was on a bus once with Doyle Holly was the driver, and I asked him, and he he thinks that he was there, and he said we played a lot of shows, man. <laughs> <laughs> He's our bus driver in the '80s for the Sweethearts of the Rodeo for one one run, and I didn't even know it was him for the first day or so, you know, and when I found out I and I've spent the rest of my time on that trip in the jump seat asking him questions. <laughs> like, this guy's not going to need any coffee. So he's going to have me over there pestering him all the way home. <laughs> yeah.